Hi, we're back with Unit 3, and here we are with Unit 3A, which is on large numbers in the media. And we're going to start with a uh, imaginary sign that you might see if you were traveling down the road. Um, it says, crisis, 36% um, of the unemployed have been out of work for 27 weeks or more. And the question asks is, um, what groups might have wanted to publish this statement and what are some social issues or political ideas that they might support? So when you see this sign, um, because it has the word crisis and because it has kind of a fairly large number of, a fairly high percentage and a fairly large number of weeks, um, this would be probably put up by someone who um, is, is concerned about unemployment and is trying to get others to um, join in a fight or a, a a political movement towards uh, doing something about unemployment. Um, also could be someone who is against the, the current administration um, hoping to have a change in, in the elections or in, in the uh, laws. So um, it said says here that you hear and see commercials, billboards, pamphlets use quantitative information every day and quantitative, that word quantitative information means quantity it has numbers in it um, people use statements like this uh, as evidence to convince you to do certain things so what are some examples of things in that advertisements try to convince you to do well of course advertisements try to convince you to um, join a cause or support a cause um, they try to get you to buy things uh, they try to get you to um, go places and so we're very aware of uh, a lot of the advertising things that happen on commercials and billboards and magazines and um, internet and things like that um, the question is we often don't know whether these statements are true and there's been a lot of talk lately about false advertising fake news this kinds of things so um, one of the things as a as a good consumer as a good um, member of society is to know uh, the difference between or to be able to analyze uh, quantitative data. Um, and so this data was actually published in January 2014 by the uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics and was declared a crisis by news outlets. Um, do you think it was a reasonable statement to make? Well, we don't know yet. Uh, we probably should look at that a little bit more and, and, and see what it means and see um, if we would think of it as a crisis. So the question they ask here is, without doing any further research, how can you determine whether the statement is reasonable? And um, my basic answer to that is, we just kind of we can analyze it. We need to look at what does it, what does that mean? Um, what would that, in, what would uh, thirty-six percent for twenty-seven weeks um, mean in actual practice? So I'm just going to put here. We need to analyze it mathematically a little bit. And so, um, in the previous question, it says you thought about different ways to decide if the statement was reasonable. Uh, one approach that we can do is we can compare the total number of people who have been unemployed for 27 weeks to the total number of people who have found jobs. So, um, this is a little bit complicated setup. I'm going to try to um, explain it as best I can. So, say we have a town um, of a hundred people or a, a town that has a hundred people unemployed at any given time so we have a town and it has a hundred people unemployed um, at the end of um, the first week 64 people found a job and 36 people did not find a job then that would be um, 36 people that were still unemployed so after week two um, we have these 64 people that have found jobs. We still have uh, 100 people that are unemployed, but these are 64 new people because these 64 people found a job. And so these 36 people are the same people. So as you go down this uh, list, these 36 over the course of 27 weeks are the same 36 people. And this is just a, a way to hypothesize it. It's not... Um, very realistic in the, in the real world but as far as what we're doing mathematically here to see what 
36% are unemployed after 27 weeks. Um, this is the easiest way to look at it. So we have 36 people that remain unemployed for the entire 27 weeks. Each week we have 64 people that find a job and then another new 64 people that come unemployed. But then again we have those 64 find a job and we have 64 new people. So over the course of the week of the 27 weeks every week 64 people find a job. So how many people is that total? Well uh, so we're on 5a. So over the course of the 27 weeks, 64 people each week times 27 weeks is how many people actually found jobs over the course of those 27 weeks. So 64 times 27 is uh, 1,728. And so over the course of the 26 weeks, 1,728 people got jobs, became unemployed, but then got a job. And then um, of all the people who are unemployed for some time over the 27-week people, what percentage did not find a job? Well, um, those same 36 remained unemployed. So again, remember, we're not going to take that times 27 weeks because those are the same people just sitting in this category. So they were unemployed, 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 unemployed. So they just sat in this category while these people cycled in and out. So there were 36 unemployed over the total of the 27 weeks. So if we add this together, there were 1,728 that got a job. There were 36 that were unemployed. So we have a total of, I'll uh, do a little hand calculation here, 1,764 that became unemployed sometime during that period. But out of those, of all the people who were unemployed, what percentage did not find a job? Well, that's only these 36 because all these people found a job. So only 36 out of the 1,764 did not find a job. And yes, they've been unemployed for 27 weeks, and that's, that's frustrating and, and, and hard, but they remained on the unemployed roster for 27 weeks while all these other people got jobs. But at the end, if you look, 36 out of the 100 are still unemployed after 27 weeks. And so that's where the data comes from on the prior page. But if you look at that over the course of the 27 weeks, 36 out of 1,764 people that became unemployed, that's only 2% that remained unemployed. That became unemployed, so this is approximately 0 0.02 or 2% became unemployed and remained unemployed. So that doesn't sound nearly as bad as 36%. It's not that the data, other data was incorrect, it's just that it's a little bit misleading because it makes you think that 36% of all people remain unemployed for 27 weeks, but it's not. Um, so it said, uh, so of all the people who are unemployed for some time over the 27-week period, what percentage did not find a job at all? That's the 2%. What percentage of unemployed people in week 27 were out of a job the entire time? So that's where we're, we're getting that 36%. So if we look at just this number, in this week, there are 100 people, and out of those 100 people, 36 have been unemployed the whole time. So that's where that number 36% comes from. It's not incorrect. It just sounds worse than it is when you, when you look at the, uh, the actual numbers. So now to kind of finalize this up, it says, after doing this analysis, does it change your initial reaction to the statistic at the beginning of the lesson? Yeah, it makes us realize that um, the 36% um, is not as... Uh, not as much as a crisis as you might have thought it was. Um, so it helps us to understand um, fully what it means.
and that we're only that 36 percent is for those unemployed in that in that one week that 127th week not over the course of the entire 27 week period so that 26 percent is those that are actually unemployed in the 27th week not all that are unemployed over the 27 week period so um, is there a way to rewrite the statement to make it more representative of the data so we could use maybe use that two percent we could say um, over the course of 27 weeks two percent of people who become unemployed remain unemployed and that might be some Thing that somebody who was positive with the current administration or you know positive about the current administration didn't think that there was unemployment um, change needed or different laws um, made my post as their sign as their billboard um, rather than the 36 percent um, so it says based on your own personal beliefs how would you rewrite the statement so you know that's kind of up to you um, do you think that that's a crisis do you think that's not a crisis um, which statement do you feel is um, more accurate, more um, telling of the true situation? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Lesson 3B. This is um, one of the student success lessons, and um, but I thought I might just kind of talk through it a little bit. Um, in your life outside of school, what do you do when you get stuck on something? They want to bring up this idea that you want to use some of the same resources when you're stuck on schoolwork as you are when you're stuck in things in other parts of your life um, and we're talking about anything from trying to remember what spices you need for some for an enchilada um, having to change the oil in your car and having to make a serious life decision um, what do you do well some of the things we do is we might ask a family member for help we might google something we might look it up on YouTube any of those things are things that we readily do in our real life but sometimes students are hesitant to do it with their schoolwork again feeling that maybe you have to you know stick with the resources um, that are given for the class but that's that's not something that we want to encourage we want to encourage um, the idea that no matter what the situation is whether it's schoolwork life um, that you want to use any resources and all resources that you have so um, list five things you've needed help with in recent memory they don't have to be big things um, so you know I might list some things um, I had to have uh, get some help the other day changing the tail light on my car. It wasn't that I didn't know how to do it, but I needed a different tool than I had, and so I had to go seek out, uh, you know, where could I find this this funky screwdriver that I needed to get my tail light off. Um, getting uh, work done, you know, I in very recent history have, you know, asked coworkers for help. We have a lot of things going on at Kingwood right now with all the online classes. I've asked um, people at work for help. I've helped people at work. Um, getting with the online classes um, I bought this new tablet that I'm using for this I had to um, look at the directions and I had to google it and find out what tablet do I want and and how do I use it and will it do what I need and things like that um, when you're trying to get things done around the house of course you ask you know family members for help um, things like that um, figuring out what's for dinner you might ask other people for, hey what do you feel like having um, look up recipes on the internet or from your old recipe book or things like that and then of course there's the big things like where to go to college should you get married uh, where should you um, live for a new apartment or should you buy a new house you know those are things that you might go to an expert for a, a financial advisor or a uh, college advisor or uh, a high school counselor or a college counselor or uh, you might talk to your friends and your family things like that so you know just lots of things that again if it was in in quote unquote real life you, you're gonna go out and you're gonna ask ask for help or seek out resources for um, so how many times in this class many times in this class now we've discovered concepts just by talking about them with each other well we don't get to talk to each other but you have discovered concepts by uh, listening to me yeah um, so what concepts did you struggle with 
initially that were made easier um, through discussions or through listening to the video or through look, looking through the helps on on my math lab are you using those helps on my math lab are you using the um, the things that that are available there in my math lab to help you with the problem um, and also talking about math outside of class can help um, don't hesitate please 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 they've gone to a lot of effort to try to restore um, our tutoring services and so please don't hesitate to go to the tutoring services there's tutoring services at Atascacita and there's a tutoring services at Kingwood and there's also um, so let me write this down. So there's Kingwood, there's Atascacita, and then um, any other campus that is um, a Lone Star campus, whether that be Montgomery or North Harris, or uh, there's a Conroe Center, there's um, you know anywhere, SciFair, any of the other campuses or centers, you're welcome to use. Um, you're a Kingwood, or not, excuse me, you're not just a Kingwood student, you're a Lone Star student. So you're you can access any of those other resources at any of the other campuses at any time. Um, that even goes for their, um, you know, their other facilities, whether it be rec facilities or or anything like that. Um, you can go to their bookstores. You can go. Sometimes the bookstore is a little funky because they won't carry the books that aren't at that campus. But um, you can go to buy um, other things uh, at those bookstores and such. Um, but anyway, the tutoring, make sure that you uh, don't hesitate to take advantage of that if you feel like you need it. Um, I have a link on the D2L page that you can find that on. And there's also online tutoring. Again, there's a link in the D2L page. Um, uh, it's called Brightspace, and it's available 24-7, and it's free. And I've heard some good things about it. Uh, you Basically, you submit a question, and, and they get back with you and get you an answer on it. Um, and also, don't hesitate to, um, to message or email other students within the class. Um, you can do that in D2L um, and reach out to some other students uh, for questions if you want to or say hey I need I really would like to get a study group together does anybody want to meet you know at the SCC on campus at a certain time. Um, I'm not going to encourage anyone to meet strangers in a non uh, Lone Star location so when I'm saying get together with a group of people I'm saying get together um, either at Atascacita or at Kingwood um, or somewhere um, like that where you can uh, where you can meet together as students. Okay, so we're going to uh, start with this next lesson, and I just need to tell you that the picture that's with this lesson is incorrect. So um, the picture that's supposed to be with this lesson is supposed to be a uh, a sign for a sale on a phone um, that was regularly um, eight hundred fifty dollars and is a sale price of forty percent off. And so the question is, um, what's your estimate of the sale price? Um, try to make your estimation calculations mentally. So um, they want us to, to look at this and think about this um, without actually grabbing the calculator and doing the work. So what are some things we could think of? We could think, well, um, regularly $850, that's close to $1,000. It's close to $800. It's close to $900, however you want to think of it. And then if we look at the sale price of 40% off, 40% um, off is almost half. It's not quite half, of course, would be 50%. But if we wanted to look at it along um, those lines, you know, almost half off of almost $900, um, you know, you could estimate that maybe it's uh, $400 off because it's not quite half. Um, and so maybe around, I don't know, $450. Now, how close is that? Um, and there's different strategies we can use too. Let me talk about a couple other strategies before we talk about how close it is. It's also very um, quick most of the time to determine what 10% is. So if we were looking at 10% of 850, that would be $85. 10% is just shifting the decimal back one spot. So once you get 10%, you can build off of that. So 20% would be double that, which would be $170 off. I'm going to add up here. This was $400 off, by the way. Um, $450 left for the price. And it, so 10% uh, is $85 off. 20% is $170 off. And then 40% would be double that. If we needed 30%, we could just add another $85. But double 40% would be um, $340 off. 
Well, again, we're estimating, so we don't need to be exact. So 340 is about 350. And so we're looking at a sale price of about $500. Two very different strategies. This one was a little bit more exacting. This one was a little bit more um, loose. But still, would either of these numbers be enough to, to help you decide whether you wanted to purchase that phone or not? So let's see um, what that is exactly. Uh, if we take uh, $850 and we multiply that times 40%, which I always tell students to avoid the percent button on your calculator because they always they work different on different calculators. So instead of putting in 40%, I'm going to put in 0.4, which is 40% as a decimal. And that's $340 off, which is exactly what we got here. So if we take $850 and we subtract $340, then that phone would then have a new price of, or a sale price of $510. Um, so knowing some estimation strategies allows you to make quick decisions. It's something that, um, you know, again, if you're at the store and you don't know how much something is, um, you don't have, the nice thing these days is you, you do most of the time have a, a, a calculator in your back pocket on your phone. Um, but if you didn't or you didn't want to pull it out, uh, to use the calculator on your phone, you might want to, you know, try to get, get an estimate. So let's start with that same sale price and that and look at some different percentages off. So if you're looking at 25% off, um, one strategy for 25% is that's about a fourth off. Um, and a fourth is um, half of half. So if you want to know what a fourth off of something is, if you can figure out what half off is and then cut that in half again, that can get you there. So again, think of this, um, you don't have to think of it as 850, you could think of it as 800 um, or 900 and go from there. So 800 is easier to cut in half. So say this, we think of this phone as being about $800, half off would be $400 off and so 25% off or a quarter off would be $200 off. So maybe about $200 off. In other words, it'd be selling for about $650. It's not exact, but it might be enough for you to make a decision without having to um, sit down and calculate it on your calculator. Um, you could also use this strategy. You could do like 10, 20, 30. So you could just figure out what 10% is and then triple it and then kind of go halfway in between. I think that's a harder method. I like this method, but everybody, um, you know, everybody's brain works a little bit different. So 35%, you could use the 10% strategy again and do um, 10, 20, 30, 40, and it'd be between 30 and 40%. But something that's important to remember with 35% is that's pretty close to one third. So one third, it would be 33.3 repeating. Um, 33%, but that's pretty close. So one third off is easier to calculate. So if we think up here again that $850 is, you know, $800 to $900, a third off of $900 would be maybe about $300 off. So the phone would sell for about uh, $550. And we'll come back and calculate this exactly, see how close we are. And then 70% off. For that, that might be easier to just multiply. Um, if you think of, again, 850 is between 8 and 900. Um, 8 times 7 would be 56. 9 times 7 would be 63. So 56 to 63, maybe about $600 off. And so that's quite a bit. I mean, 70% is, is way past half. And so, um, it, you know, the phone may be down to around, say, 250. So let's go back and actually calculate those. So if we started with the 850 um, at 25% off, 25% off would be $212.50 off. Well, with our very quick ex estimate, we had $200 off. So it would be a little less than $350 or $650 if it was 25% off. Um, Let's clear that and see. But again, plenty close to be able to make a decision on whether that's worth it to you or not. So 35% off would be um, almost $300 off. We're almost spot on there. We're only $2.50 off. Um, so again, if you take 800 
minus 297.50, go to the effort of actually calculating it by hand, you get um, $502.50. Um, oh, I think I did that wrong. Hold on a second. I think I did 800 instead of 850. So 850 minus 297.5. There we go. So $552.50. So even just our quick calculation, we were only $2.50 off. And then if we were going to do 70% off, um, 850 times 0.7 is $595 off, which again, we said $600 off. So instead of $250 is $255. But in your decision making, that probably wouldn't make a difference. So these are just some quick ways that you can um, estimate percentages um, if you are in a situation where you need to calculate by hand or need to calculate quickly. So now we're just going to look at another situation with percentages and, and estimating percentages. And um, one thing I want to point out with estimating is the idea of estimating is to round the numbers ahead of time and use those rounded numbers or those easier numbers ahead of time Estimating is not taking an exact answer and rounding it. That's just rounding. Um, estimating is taking the numbers before you manipulate it, before you do the, the addition, subtraction, whatever you need to do with it, um, and, and rounding the numbers or estimating or uh, making them easier before the calculations. So um, in this case, it says a law enforcement officer reviews the following data from two precincts. She makes a quick estimate to answer the following question. If a violent incident occurs, in which precinct is it more likely to involve a weapon? So we have precinct one, where there were 25 violent incidents, and five of them included a weapon. Well, of course, five is a lot less um, incidences of involving a weapon than 18. But if you go over here and you compare, that's out of 122 actual incidents. So this precinct had a lot more incidents um, and it also had more violent incidences, but how do they per, uh, compare percentage-wise? So um, if we were going to look at that, um, and we want to do it without, um, without actually calculating, how does 5 out of 25 compare to 18 out of 122? So 5 out of 125, um, I know, reduces to 1 fifth. And I know 1 fifth, I'm not even going to say approximately, it actually equals 20%. I know 1 fifth is less than 1 fourth. It's less than 25%. It actually is 20%. So how does this compare? Well, these are kind of more difficult numbers, so let's, let's round them a little bit. Let's say 18 is almost 20, and 122 is close to 120. So I rounded that one down and that one up, but not by very much. Um, and 20 out of 120 reduces to 1 sixth. Well, how does 1 sixth compare to 1 fifth? Well, 1 sixth is less. If I have something split into six pieces and I take one of them, that's going to be smaller than if I have that same item and I split it into five pieces and take one of them. 1 sixth is... Um, if you calculate it, you know, exactly, which isn't exactly what we're trying to do, but one-third is, is 0 0.33333, and one-sixth is about um, 0 0.167. And so um, that would be about 16.7%. Okay, so this precinct, even though it has higher violent incidences and higher incidents involving a weapon, the comparison of these weapon uh, incidences to the total incidences is, is less. Um, and then last but not least, we're going to talk about um, what if you have a credit card balance or a credit card that awards you cash back bonus? Great advertising thing that they try to do with credit cards. What does it actually mean when they say that you get a 0.5% cash back? Well, $462 is the amount that you have put on your credit card. We know how to do 10%. What's 10% of 462? Well, that would be $46.20. So let's roll that back one more spot. What would 1% be? 
Well, that would be 23, whoops, sorry, I don't know where I got that from. Um, that would be $4.62. That would move the decimal back another place. So 10%, you move the decimal back one spot. 1%, you move it back two spots. So $4.62. Well, 0.5% is half of 1%. So your cash back on that $462 that you spend would be a whopping $2.31. Um, so again, having that quantitative reasoning skills and understanding what they're actually telling you is, is very important. If you go out and get a credit card because it's going to get you a you know 0.5% back, you have to spend a lot of money to get anything, you know, to get much of anything back. Um, and so again, a good skill to know. Okay, so now we're going to um, finish up with Lesson 3D. Um, a lot of this I kind of cheated a little bit in the last lesson um, and did already. So this, uh, we actually won't go into this in a lot of detail. But the first question that's asked is, um, when might someone be satisfied with an estimate and when might an exact calculation be needed? So what first comes to mind is, you know, you might be okay with an estimate when you're trying to make a decision. But, you know, you want, when you get up to that register, you and the store want uh, the exact amount when you actually purchase. So when you get up to that register and you actually purchase the phone, you're going to want that exact value. Um, an estimate isn't going to quite do. So um, it says now to find the exact sale price if the phone is 20% off. So our phone was uh, $850 and we wanted to take 20% off. So 20% off, 20% um, is the same as a 0.2 as a decimal, so we take 20% of 850, and if you calculate that, uh, 850 times 0.2, um, we already kind of did this in the last lesson, but I'll just write it down again, that's $170. And that's how much is off. So then we're gonna have to take $850 minus $170, and that would get us our sale price of, um, and I'm going to do this in my head, but I want to explain what I'm doing. So if I took $150 off, that would be $700, but I'm taking a little bit more than that, so it's actually $680. But again, you don't have to do that in your head. You can do that on your calculator. Um, I'm not going to take your calculator away from you. So $850 minus uh, 170, we get a sale price of $680 on sale. And then these amounts we already did in the last lesson, so I'm not going to do those again. And how close is your calculation to the estimate we made? Um, again, you know, we had some pretty good estimates that were that were going on um, when we were working on that in the last last lesson. We did our estimates and we compared. So for the last couple questions here, it says calculate the exact amount of your cashback bonus if your credit card awards a 0.5% bonus. We calculated that already. Let me just kind of redo it. We said, well, if it's $462, one thing that's easy to calculate is 10%. That's $46.20, which would then make 1% $4.62. And half of 1% is what 0.5% is, and so that would be half of this, so you would get a cash back of $2.31. And then last but not least in this lesson, we have um, a phone that's $119.99, and it's on sale for $86. So we're kind of going backwards here. It's on sale for $86, and it wants us to uh, calculate the percentage discount. First estimate, and then calculate. So if you have... Um, $86 is the current cost, and the original phone was essentially $120. So you have $120, and it's now on sale for $86. Well, how much was taken off? Well, that's about $35, $34. So if you took $34 off $120, that's what we're trying to figure out. What's $34 off? of $120. So to estimate that, um, it's not quite a third because a third or 34% would be 
um, about a third of a hundred dollars. So it's not quite a third off of 120, maybe a fourth, maybe it's 25%. Um, that's my estimate. Again, you might estimate something different. So now let's actually calculate it. To actually calculate that, again, we did 120 minus 86 to figure out how much was off. So it was $34 off. And if it's $34 off of the original $120, we're trying to figure out what percentage 34 is of 120. So we're going to take 34 and divide it by 120. So if I grab my, um, my calculator for that, then 34 out of 120 is actually 28.3% off. So I was a little low with the 25%, but that's kind of a weird amount to, to have off. So we'll say it's approximately, because it says to round it to the nearest percentage, it's about 28% percent off. So we were pretty close, especially considering this was kind of a very weird percentage off. Um, so that uh, that completes unit three. Um, I'm not going to do unit or lesson 3e. Um, that is on uh, developing self-regulation and you, you're welcome to read through it. It's got some good things in it, but it talks about um, are you using some of the things that are within your homework that are helped? Like, are you thinking about how well you did on the homework assignment and being honest with yourself? Um, and it talks about the self-regulation cycle, which is evaluating something, planning for it, implementing your plan and monitoring it, and then evaluating again. So that self-regulation is, is, what do I need to do? Um, let's make a plan. Let's implement that plan. And then how did it go? Did it go well? Do I need to do something different or can I continue with that same plan on the next go around? So um, go ahead and, and, and read through 3E. It's got some good things in it, but um, I'm not going to include it here in the video.